and following him are some legendary figures in archaeology and other disciplines too. So it's really, it's really a uh, magical evening here along the Hampton River at the Hampton History Museum. Gerald H. Johnson, what do you say? Ger Gerald H. Johnson is truly a magnificent teacher. And if I think of you, Jerry, I think of the word teacher. I could hate him before I came here. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry helped us with the exhibit upstairs, the Fragile Balance, which is the first exhibit we have done on natural history. And I'm an historian, I understand Native Americans, I understand English settlement, I understand the Civil War and such. But I did not understand this. So Jerry came to our rescue. And you know, I remember taking a class many years ago in geology, and the professor had a yardstick. This is an old story. And he points to the yardstick and says, well, that quarter of an inch there is recorded history. And all the rest of it is geological history. And that, and that gives you an idea of the type of scope that Gerald H. Johnson has worked with throughout his whole life, this huge, vast uh, space of, of, of history. And as Jerry would come in and help us with uh, ideas for the exhibit and text for the exhibit, he's a natural teacher. I actually, I actually saved a piece of paper that you sketched a lesson on about some lesson in ge geology. And you sit there just and talking, just you and I. You start talking and start drawing. And can you imagine all the years? Jerry, Jerry went to school in Indiana, got his PhD there, went to women there, and started teaching at women there. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Look at this guy. All the people he's defending is the same. And he ended up teaching in 2001, and he's still teaching. To this very moment, <laughs> he's written much. He's been written much on geological history. He's also been involved very much in court history, um, the work at Jamestown and prehistoric sites all through uh, Virginia. He's published all kinds of things, and uh, it's just really, really an honor. And I got to tell you, Jerry, a lot of fun too having you here tonight, Jerry Johnson. Yay. So many of you would come out on a night like this. <laughs> you and great weather. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, he didn't tell you that I came from Amish country, did you? Don't say Pennsylvania. <laughs> the largest population of Amish in North America is in the tri-state district of Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan. There's about a quarter of a million there. Got that? Somebody said that's right. I went to a one-room schoolhouse, two babes. <laughs> okay, anyways. Oh, by the way, don't you ever make a comment about being a minority. Last year I was there, there were eight grades, one teacher, 54 kids, and 53 were Amish. <laughs> I'm not Amish. <laughs> okay, anyway. okay, so what I'd like you to talk to you is, uh, you all walk in on this really flat ground, but I'd like to take you down can you all hand me back there? Yes, sir. If, if I get to talking, right, you hold up your hand, and I'll cuss at you. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I'd like to begin at the ground and just drop back a few million years. To be exact, about 260 million years, okay? You got that? Where's your remote? Does it work? It should. Is this it? Okay. These modern gadgets. Is this it? Yes, it is. Uh, can you just go ahead and do it from the Okay, we'll do it up there. I think you'll be impressed by the first slide. <laughs> now that's really to get your attention because a couple things are happening through the geologic history that are more pedestrian than an asteroid hitting the Earth. Okay, number one. Sea level's been going up and down, up and down, up and down. Right. When it's down, the land gets eroded. When it's up, it gets covered with another layer of sediment. Got that? Mm -hmm. That's a fundamental understanding. We're going to deal with time. And we're not going to cover all the time. We're going to jump from time to time 
uh, with, which events are really recorded here in some way. I cannot talk about all of them, okay? Uh, what produced the Chesapeake Bay? The Susquehanna Lowlands. Basically nothing to do with the impact crater. Oh, it was Erosion. Erosion, yeah. That's, that's it. But the point I'd like to is what, what I'm doing, it takes time to accomplish. Got it? Good. Okay. Now, so I can find these buttons. And we'll go down. Uh -huh. Now, you all know the parts of Virginia, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay, if you don't, you hold up your hand. Because I'll tell you what I do. I love the people who have the confidence to show that they don't know something. You know that? That really takes a lot of guts for kids in particular. Okay, let's start. The western part here is the Appalachian Plateaus. Next is a, 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 an area characterized by ridges and valleys. So what are you going to call that province? I'll give you a hint. Ridge and valleys. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's called, the Ridge and Valley province. Then there's this bluish cast ridge through here, which we're going to call? Blue Ridge. Blue Ridge. Now that's something to keep in mind, because that's going to come to play a little later in our discussion. Okay? This triangular area here is the foot of the mountain, which in French is? Piedmont. This is the coastal plain. Okay? What province is there in Virginia that the SOLs don't mention? SOL to me means the army meaning of it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. we, we technically were chartered a part of the continental shelf. So our other provinces here, which is not even mentioned in the SOLs. Okay, got that? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's why we have this. I'm going to be running back and forth. Now, if we go back about 250, 60 million years, this is what we look like. We're in there someplace, right? Eurasia, up here, had just collided with us in the north. Africa, in here, along our coastline, this area. And then, and, well, let's call it Guanabana land, or South America, plowed in from the south to create the Wachita Belt. So there's a big long grid in of mountains that are formed by this collision. Now, where's the Atlantic Ocean? There is none. That's right. It's, it, it's not formed yet because there's, there's no gap in the history record here. If we keep going here, now, notice in this one, which is really uh, in the Jurassic, notice it's starting to open up. Got it? Now that ocean. By the way, anybody traveling this coming year to Europe? No. Well, are you going to Europe? Buy your ticket this year, because next year it's going to be two and a half inches further away. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the idea is that if you don't have an ocean, you can't have the coastal plain, you can't have a Hampton. When that opens up wide enough, all of that mountain mass in the west is shed towards you. The coastal plain west of Richmond is about zero feet thick. Okay? When you come here, it's about a half a mile thick. It's all sediments underneath us. You go out 40 miles or so offshore, and it's two and a half miles thick of sediment. Now think of that. If it's a wedge like that, and you carried it back over the Piedmont and the Blue Ridge and the Valley Ridge, we'd really have some mountains. Get the picture? <laughs> okay, so here's the one that everybody gets excited about. It's called the Yucatan Impact. Uh, it occurred about 65 and a half million years ago, and living before that event were these nice marine reptiles, look like fish and ichthyosaurs, uh, long neck things called plesiosaurs. You had birds flying around, and you know what I didn't put on the slide? I didn't put dinosaurs on because you've all seen a dinosaur. Got it? However, how many have had a dinosaur phone in their hand lately? <laughs> when you get it, look at it. Because the marrow is not in your light. The marrow is very small. But the support.